Now it's time to update my grandfather's words by explaining them and by doing so, changing our understanding of our place on the planet, who we are, and what goes on inside and between us. It's about reconnecting our sense of self and our soul with our waterways and oceans. It's about finding our creativity, clarity and confidence in our deep blue minds. That's from Celine Cousteau, who opens up Wallace J. Nichols' Blue Mind book with a fascinating look into the depths of the ocean, reminding us of the words that meant the most to her grandfather, the great Jacques Cousteau. He said, the sea, once it casts its spell, holds one in its net of wonder forever. People protect what they love. Welcome back to season 10 of the Neuroscience Meets Social and Emotional Learning Podcast, where we connect the science-based evidence behind social and emotional learning that's finally being taught in our schools today and emotional intelligence training used in our modern workplaces for improved well-being, achievement, productivity, and results. Using what I saw as the missing link the application of practical neuroscience. I'm Andrea Samadhi, an author and an educator with a passion for learning, and launched this podcast five years ago with the goal of bringing all the leading experts together in one place to uncover the most current research that would bring back how the brain learns best by taking us all to new and often unimaginable heights. For today's episode number 297, we're diving into the depths of the ocean and learning about some concepts that Dr. Wallace J. Nichols has discovered that he calls Blue Mind, the surprising science that shows how being near, in, or underwater can make you happier, healthier, more connected, and better at what you do. When I was first introduced to Dr. Nichols, I was on a summer vacation with the family and we were just packing up our trip next to the clearest, bluest water I've ever seen. We were at Grace Bay in Turks and Caicos. My friend and performance coach, Luke Dupron from episode 90, sent me an introduction to Dr. Nichols for our podcast. And when I saw his book, I couldn't have been more excited. I always wanted to understand the why behind certain things. And the ocean and water in general is something I've always been fascinated with. I took one look at Dr. Nichols' book, Blue Mind, and I was instantly captivated. He asked some of the questions that I've always wondered. What is water? And why are we as humans so enthralled by it? Then I looked at the cover of the book and the tagline got me thinking. Then I thought, what happens to me when I'm swimming in water? Why do I suddenly feel more creative than I do when I'm sitting at my desk or more connected to others? And what happens to me when I dive down to the bottom of the ocean? Now I'm reading Dr. Nichols' book and hoping to answer these questions and also a bit surprised that I never thought of the brain and water connection. If you've been following this podcast for some time, you'll know that I've been working on the brain and learning connection and neuroscience is helping the field of education to make huge strides as we know so much more about how the brain learns best today than we did 20 years ago. What we're doing essentially is expanding our level of awareness. Then I read about awareness in Blue Mind from the late author David Foster Wallace, who said in a commencement speech in 2005 that education should be based on awareness. Awareness of what is so real and essential. It's so hidden in plain sight all around us all the time. Now my mind is wide open. My level of awareness has expanded as he says, this is water. And I'm now making the mind-brain connection. And this is all just the beginning. I've got some questions for Dr. Nichols that I hope will expand all our levels of awareness around this thing called water and how this understanding could possibly make our lives better by making the brain water connection. Let's meet Dr. Wallace J. Nichols and dive deep underwater together to see what we can learn from his unique perspective 
and movement that he calls Blue Mind. Welcome, Dr. Nichols. I am so sure that you could tell from the emails that I sent back and forth that this interview was very important to me. Something about being introduced to you know, you and your book when I was standing in front of the bluest water I've ever seen. So welcome. Thank you so much for meeting with me today to talk about your book, Blue Mind. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely. And I'm very familiar with that blue water that you were um, really? sitting and standing in front of. I spent a lot of time there. So Very um, nice. It was magical, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Well, after I saw the introduction to you from Luke Dupron, who I've got to know through the podcast world, I quickly bought your book. And then I started my journey into Blue Mind. And it took many twists and turns along the way. But I've got to begin with the foreword because it took me a minute to make the connection between Celine and the great Jacques Cousteau, who I used to watch on television. So what she wrote was profound. Can you talk a little bit about what she said when she talked about how the sea, once it casts its spell, holds one in a net of wonder forever? Can you just... Yeah, yeah Celine. So Celine is, is Jacques Cousteau's... A granddaughter, one of his granddaughters, and Jacques was one of my childhood heroes, along with a billion other people's childhood hero. And um, he was really a pioneer in ocean exploration. But if you look at what he wrote and said, he had his finger on Blue Mind. He really understood it, and it really was his his driving force was that that net of wonder, um, that feeling of. Uh, that water water gives us um, that it, the place that it transports us to this place of awe and wonder and magic. And uh, Celine's a good friend, uh, as are her 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 cousins and her brother. And um, I asked her; she has a background in psychology, and I asked her if she would kindly write a forward to Blue Mind, and she jumped at it. And she wrote a bit about her grandfather and his sort of prescient ideas. He didn't back those ideas up with neuropsychology. He just knew them to be true. And they're some of his most profound quotes that are often repeated. But in Celine's forward, she, she kind of wrestles with the, um, the idea of explaining the magic, explaining the awe and the wonder, and whether we really should. Should we just leave it in the realm of poetry and magic, or should we dive in as scientists and explore it? I, of course, am on the side of diving in and exploring. And so she, in her in her beautifully written forward, uh, comes to the conclusion that her grandfather would dive into blue mind science. So therefore, let's let's do it. And I thought it, it really was a great opening um, to that exploration and 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 what has kind of flowed since uh, she wrote that. So so then what made you think of connecting the mysteries of the brain? I thought that was brilliant. Like we we are still unfolding the mysteries of the brain. And then you look at the ocean and you're like, what's in there? How did you make that connection? <laughs> yeah. So these two enormous realms that are still largely um, unexplored, um, the human brain, consciousness, um, and how it all works, uh, the human nervous system, not just the brain, by the way, and our inter the interactions between our, our nervous systems. Still very mysterious. We're learning a lot very quickly. And then the ocean, largely unexplored, largely unvisited, um, especially the deeper parts. And I thought, wow, the, the most complex thing in the universe, our nervous system, meets the single most important feature of life on earth, the water. Um, that could be interesting <laughs> if we put those two things yeah. together. And, uh, and initially I thought that that had probably been done and all I needed to do was go check the book out of the library and I would enjoy reading it on a beach somewhere or by a pool. And I couldn't find that book, you know, your brain on water. There were books about your brain on happiness and your brain on stress and your brain on creativity and neuroplasticity, your brain on music, some great books, but there was very little and no book about your brain on this 
ubiquitous substance called water. And so I, I really wanted to read it, this book that didn't exist. So I tried to convince some people that they should write it. And I was very un unsuccessful <laughs> uh, at that. And uh, came down to this, this guy, one of, my, one of my intellectual heroes, Dr. Oliver Sacks, who had written many books about the brain and the mind and behavior. Uh, the late great neurologist, Dr. Oliver Sacks, water lover, music lover, lover of life, amazing writer, big minded thinker. And I thought, wow, he should write this book about the brain on water. And I would love to read it after he <laughs> writes it. And I pitched the idea to him and he said, it's a fine idea. You do it. And so five years later, I brought him um, a copy of Blue Mind and said, here you go. He you commanded, demanded, or strongly suggested that this happen. And it took me a while because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I'm a, I'm a marine scientist, marine biologist. And, um, I studied sea turtles for 30 years. Uh, I'm not a, a neuropsychologist. And so I kind of came in the side door, um, had a lot to learn, talked to a lot of people, attended a lot of conferences, listened to a lot of courses and podcasts and Etc. Read a lot of books to kind of put this theory together. So, well, I think you did a phenomenal job, and I mentioned to you because uh, 2014 was when you published it, right? That was when an educator told me I needed to add neuroscience to my work with schools, and I'd never thought about my brain. And so, you have picked every single person that's relevant in the field of neuroscience. Like I'm going through, and I'm like. Picking out all the people, Dr. Dan Siegel, I just kept circling it and making graphics. So I was like, he got another one. So how, I'm just curious, where did you go to pick out who you backed up your neuroscience with? Yeah, kind of everywhere. I was like a sponge. And it was a weird, it was a weird time because I came, I came from, you know, the water sciences and people weren't thinking about neuropsychology at all and they weren't funding it. So I was zero for 10 on grant proposals and, you know, sort of foundation support. So I was convinced it was a bad idea by my peers, <laughs> but I felt in like in my heart, you know, that thing, I was like, just do it. And so um, I was pulling together peer reviewed, you know, research that existed and that it was and connecting the dots, um, finding, digging through works of people like Dan Siegel and finding any mention. And there's some, there's a great passage where he reflects on his own connection with water and kind of waxes poetically about it. And, um, and then we put together something called the blue mind summits. And I invited the best water people and the best brain people or wow. best neuro neuro people and psychologists that I could get to answer the phone. And I said, come, come together. I'm going to pair you up groups of two or three. I'm going to ask you to answer a question you've never thought of before in front of a, a small group of people who will be very interested in your thoughts. And so that's what we've done for the past almost 13 years now. And it's been fascinating. So to pair up, um, let's say like a guy, a emeritus professor of neuroscience at UCSF named Howard Fields, who studies um, dopamine, the, the, the dopamine system, pairing him up with a big wave, pioneering big wave surfer, Jeff Clark, and getting them into a deep conversation about dopamine and surfing. And at the time, that nobody had done that. And so everybody in the room was just enthralled. Um, or, you know, pairing a neuroscientist up with a someone who has gotten through their addiction by using blue mind therapy. Um, and so on and so forth with all, all these interesting pairings of people you, you would love to hear, have a conversation, but who we're never going to meet, you know, through happenstance, they don't hang out in the same places. Howard Fields doesn't surf. Jeff Clark doesn't do neuroscience. So they weren't going to overlap most likely. Um, and so curating those conferences or we called them summits because they were really small groupings of people and but wonderful, deep conversations. And so I drew from that as well, uh, along with poetry and art and prose, Moby Dick, Pablo Neruda, 
the Beach Boys, um, Hollywood does Blue Mind really well. You can think of all the scenes in movies that water just lights things up. Um, water is romantic. Water is healing. James Bond goes to the Scottish River after his world literally blows up just to recenter himself and come back and try to, you know, save the world. Um, you've got all these scenes. I mean, Titanic, you know, the king of the world scene, um, not the end. That's different. That's red mind. Uh, <laughs> but the, you know, so it's everywhere and advertisements you see blue mind being used to sell financial services and pharmaceuticals and cars and, Mountain Dew and so Hollywood gets it Park Avenue gets it but the people trying to save the lakes and the rivers and the oceans weren't quite getting it and so that was my impetus to kind of connect the dots and and write a book about it and 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 talk to people like you who are you know involved in dissemination of information to educators and students beyond so there was so much there that just brought some things to life for me because so you go on these these trips with your family we would go to hawaii sometimes we go to the north shore and i didn't know why but i would be fascinated with those billabong big surf like areas where they where their contests would take place and it was off season no one was there but i would stand there and stare at it and wonder what was it like and then you brought up hollywood you know you watch the the movies like maverick with Jay Moriarty, I I have the same birthday as that guy. And I have this connection. I'm like, I wonder what it was like for him. And then he died going underwater and holding his breath. And and Hollywood really captures it well. But I just never really understood it. I would stand there and it was very obvious. What's what's wrong with with me? I'm like staring at the water and not really getting it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's very common. Yeah. yeah, I hear that a lot. That one of the most common comments I hear is I from people is I felt this way my whole life, but I didn't know what it was. And many times people feel like it's just them who yeah. are mesmerized. And it turns out we're not alone. <laughs> I mean, it, it may be everyone that has some version of of a blue mind feeling. Um, and it's not always the ocean. It's it's all water. And it could be a puddle that you're stomping in. It could be rain falling from the sky. It could be frozen water. We call that ice and snow. Uh, it could be fog and clouds and mist. Uh, it could be a giant Pacific Ocean. It could be a little creek uh, or a little fountain on your desk or a fountain downtown um, or a shower or a bath, a uh, swimming pool. I mean, the list is long of all all the sources of Blue Mind, but it does it and it does it. There's a continuum. So you've got the vast, you know, Pacific Ocean with the waves. Then you've got the smaller, more sublime versions that might just be a, a, a beautiful poem by Pablo Neruda about the ocean that just touches on that feeling. And it, it transports you through what I call virtual water. Uh, in the form of a poem or a piece of art an artwork or a a photograph or a song. So I think we all need to understand our, our own blue minds. That's like step one, that 8 billion people understand what we're talking about here, that they understand that there's science to back it up. It's a feeling, it's a set of emotions. It's an emotional response to water, but there's science to explain it. And so you understand your blue mind and then you um, have access to it. And then you practice, you should mindfully practice blue mind throughout your life. So when you're super stressed and I yeah, paused before I said that, because I am often these days and I think everybody else is for a variety of reasons, um, go to the water. I, you know, there are lots of techniques to help with anxiety and stress and burnout. One of them is to go to the water, you know, um, listen to the water, get in the water, float on it, a a shower, uh, let that water bang on the back of your neck, Um, go for a swim, just sit by the edge of it and look at it, read your book by the water uh, and make that a regular 
part of your your emotional toolkit. And uh, I think if we do that, if we make it common knowledge, which is my goal, is to make Blue Mind common knowledge and common practice, I think we transform well-being and wellness, but we also transform our ability to protect and restore the waters themselves. Both of those things, I think, are outcomes. Um, so I get pretty motivated and excited, even through the ups and downs of life, to keep going um, with sharing this and having conversations like this. Well, this is really deep, and it's it's sometimes happens on a podcast when I'm interviewing that the emotion comes out of me, and I just can't stop it. It's like my eyes tear up, and you know, someone might be talking about something I relate to. And, you know, this kind of hit me now when you're talking and wondering why, why do I feel this way? What do I need to learn from it? How can I use this? And, and even as we get into more of the questions, it's just so clear that there's a deep emotional side to it that, that I just want to put on the table. I don't want to hide the fact that, yeah. that it's so like I could bawl my eyes out during this interview. It's just, that's how it is. It's so deep within the emotional brain. So I, I, I know that, that you feel this, but is it because some people are more sensitive to things? Why do you think the emotion is so obvious? Well, we, when we're in the water, um, we're vulnerable. Uh, it, it, the water puts us in a place where we're the chatter that kind of protects us, the barriers that kind of protect us from life that we, you know, the armor that we put on starts fading away and we access creativity and we access compassion and curiosity and we, and connection to each other and to the water itself and to ourselves. And it's, um, a place for reflection, deep reflection, and um, deep thought, and always has been throughout all, throughout all human history, throughout all traditions, throughout all sacred texts, you will find blue mind. I've looked everywhere I look, I find it. It's this is not a new idea. It's actually one of the oldest ideas, in fact, that water soothes our soul. That's the twenty-third Psalm in the Old Testament, written by King James 3,000 years ago. Having a bad day, get down to the water, it will soothe your soul. That's, that's my paraphrase. Um, not a new idea, like deeply ancient concept. But it's true. And so why? Well, that's I, kind of what I tried to tease out in my book. But I just to go kind of deep and personal, um, I just, this past weekend was a memorial service from my biological mother. I was adopted. Um, she was my first water. I lived inside of that woman for nine months. She was my ocean. When I was born, um, I was relinquished and I did not see her again after that day for 18 years. Um, the last time I saw her was Sunday and, um, and she was in the form of, of ashes. And I released her into, into her favorite river in Montana. Um, I, I haven't even begun to understand the depth of all of that, but there's a water connection. She, she was my, I, you know, she grew me inside of her in water. So that's how I started my life, just like everybody else, swimming around in my private ocean called mom. So, yeah, this is deep. I mean, this is real and it's, it sounds like hippy dippy stuff when you kind of get into that part but no nope, 9.21 months you lived underwater in the dark yeah. um you don't remember much about it the details but it's part of you that's a chunk of time you know do anything for nine months and it's going to change you um so there's that that's that part uh the uh, the adoption piece is a whole other whole other level. She was a water lifelong water lover. Um, my adoptive mom uh, had a lifelong fear of water. Uh, they're both named Sheila, by by the way. In case I name them and I sound like I don't know my which is which, they both have the same name. 
Um, but there, yeah, we make some of our, our best memories near the water, in the water with the people we care about. Um, we have some of our deepest important thoughts near the water. We form our nostalgia. Um, we learn a lot. We reflect a lot. And, there, you know, in contrast to the built environment, so I'm sitting right now in a room that I'm relaxed enjoying this but there's visual clutter around uh i'm looking at a screen i have another smaller screen to the side that i'm not looking at but it's available um my body is coordinating about 200 muscles so that i can sit upright and not fall um but when we get to the water visually auditorily somatically our world is simplified and our brain shifts into a different place um that I refer to as blue mind and it's different in a good way. And, um, and so, yeah, we have, it opens us up to some, some emotions, um, sad things, happy things. Uh, we grieve at the water. Uh, a lot of people go to the water to grieve, to memorialize loved ones. I've heard from people who say they, they cry in the shower a lot. Um, not uncommon if you're one of those people it's a good place to do that yeah so i've got to go to the very beginning of the book where you talked about where you got your waterproof eeg cap mm -hmm. because as i'm sitting here going why do i feel this way i'm thinking wow you actually got technology that was waterproof and you dove into the ocean and measured your brain i i was yeah. just like captivated here so, you know, I just wonder what did you discover when you put that cap on? And do you have extra ones? Because I want to yeah. know what's going on with my brain when I'm going on. Well, so here's the, the reality of that. That was a very prototype situation, experimental. Um, the main thing I learned is that we had a long, we have a long way, had a long way to go to get the technology to where we, we want it. Um, the good news is 10 years later, a little over 10 years later, maybe, um, we're there. There are mobile waterproof wireless EEGs that are being used uh, to look at you know, people's brains while they're floating in water uh, without the cables, without the full cap. Um, major breakthrough. So now you can be surfing or kayaking or swimming or floating and uh, doing all kinds of activities and be be monitored um in a in a less clunky way than the technology allowed just a decade ago so that's that's the big insight the big the big breakthrough um the research the research certainly will continue uh researchers just don't stop asking questions but from my perspective the research is in enough that we can act and share and tell this story and put it into practice. So we're, we're not at this point, unlike 10 years ago, I think we were waiting for some clinical research to kind of say, yeah, this blue mind thing is real. I, we're there. Um, none of the research has said, no, water's not very good for your emotional well being. None of it. Um, unless, of course, it's flooding your basement or dripping through the ceiling and, you know, w washing your town away, then of course, it's really bad for your emotional well-being. It's the worst thing. Um, but we're talking about water when and where you want it to be. Um, so research-wise, pretty exciting. If, you're, if you want to deep dive in, into the peer-reviewed literature, go to Google Scholar and look up terms like blue mind, blue health, uh, blue space. Those are all the terminologies that are used to talk about water and wellness. Um, some of the research that I find most interesting is being done in, in float tanks, in laboratory settings. Uh, Justin Feinstein is one of the researchers. He, um, he has put people in float tanks and then slipped them over into the fMRIs and scanned their brains and then put waterproof EEGs on them and looked at heart rate and breathing rate and you know neurological activity, as well as traditional surveys and He's found that floating in water 
is literally one of the best therapies for anxiety and stress related disorders, push neck stress, uh, eating disorders, um, depression even, and that they the benefits stick and you can dig in dig into the the outcomes and you know I, I never want to overstate the research and I'll probably usually err on the side of understatement, but it's pretty cool and pretty exciting. And he would say every every hospital and therapeutic center should have a float tank because it's good for the patients, it's good for the staff, and it's good for the families of the patients and the staff to regulate their their emotional wellness. And uh, I agree with him about that. Yeah, those things are claustrophobic, though. If you <laughs> close the lid, like, what if it gets stuck? <laughs> You know, you well, to if it gets stuck, you open it. Yeah, you open it. got to be really, really yeah. uh, trusting and comfortable in water. Well, I mean, I'll just say, in case I, in case anybody was thinking, oh, I'm going to try that, and now they just decided, okay. no, I'm Sorry. not going to try it. I, I will say, um, my experience is that when you're in there, there's no light, there's no sound, there's no gravity. You can't tell where your body and the water begin and end. Um, and it feels vast feels the opposite of claustrophobic. So initially you're like, oh, I'm closing the door. I'm in this tank. Well, the door is easy to open. You just like, there's nobody out in, uh, in the room. You know, you're in a room with a tank. The door to the room is locked. You're in, you know, you can just leave the door open too because the room is dark. Um, you can hit a button and turn the lights on if you want. Uh, and so, but my experience of it is, has been that it's, the opposite of small it's that it's the there's a vastness in in the nothingness of it um and the clinical research shows that there are you know strong benefits to just really having the most rest you've ever given your nervous system in your entire life by far by far there's nothing like it in terms of giving your nervous system a break and it can become somewhat addictive. You might say, I got to do this every week for an hour for the rest of my life. Well, that's good. Those are good. Those are good addictions to have. Like resting your nervous system is a good thing to, to crave. So, so I spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about meditation because it clearly has a health benefit, um, just like exercise. And, and I just interviewed this major league baseball player, Mike Bordick. Um, th just th earlier in the week. And he talked about how fishing by the water had this meditative nature to it. And, and then in your book, you talked about how, when you measured that you actually could see your brain waves going from beta to alpha, more relaxed to theta, maybe the creativity part. So I wondered maybe when we're swimming, is that, is, is that what, what's happening to our brain? We're going through the different waves. That's part of it. And swimming, you know, swimming is still you know, fairly active. It's rhythmic. Um, there's a cadence. There's a, there's breathing, meditative breathing, you might say. So a big, um, a big inhale followed by slow exhale. Um, and you may do that for a half an hour. And some people don't breathe rhythmically for half an hour when they're meditating. So there's a physical side of it. There's a breathing part of it. Um, there's a sensory aspect. And I think, yes, it, it um, moves us into a more, a more creative space. Floating, on the other hand, takes us even deeper. So when you're still and you take away all this, the sensory inputs, um, Justin Feinstein would probably say, and I don't want to jump the gun on his research, but that we, we move into Delta, which is just surprising, actually. And I, I don't want to think that paper might be just about to come out or something, but um, he he was thinking theta was where we were headed and then he's like whoa this is yeah. deeper even deeper into this deep restful um place and uh and the other mechanisms that will get you there besides just very very deep sleep are you know um, psychedelic drugs and there's a lot of research in that arena um but wow if you can if you can get into that deep restful brain state by putting yourself in water uh that's that's good to know like 
I want yeah. everybody to know that. Like put that yeah. in your back pocket as a tool for when you need it. Yeah, the only way I know is through this Silva program that teaches you how to do it, you know, because most people don't really know what they're doing when they're meditating. And I surely didn't. It took, you know, it took me some research to see, well, well what am I supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you can figure out ways to improve what you're doing and learn different types of meditation practices. But but like you just said, if if it's in water, that's just another way, another way of taking one methodology and doing it a different way and, you know, getting a phenomenal results at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, so you could say standing by water, standing by a lake will help you meditate and relax. Well, most people are going to say, okay, I'll go stand by the lake for a few minutes, but I'm not going to stand by the lake for two hours and meditate. I get bored and people have a hard time with that. So you put a fishing pole in their hand <laughs> and now you're standing by the lake with a fishing pole in your hand, staring at the water. Maybe there's a bobber at the end if you're fishing with worms or bait. Maybe you're a, a you know, you're using a lure or you're a fly fisher person. Um, and then it's not it's not meditation and it's not quote unquote boring. And people have a, an on ramp to say, okay, you know, like your a previous interviewee. Uh, said fishing is my meditation. Yes, it is. I'm let's not call it anything else. It's that's what it is. And and it also may be a, a you know a source of social interaction and it may be uh, a physical activity. It may also be um a way to get protein in into your into your life. So uh kayaking, there are all kinds of activities, skipping stones, bird watching. Um, beach combing, um, all these activities have a, uh, at least a mildly meditative aspect that we need. And so for people who struggle with um, meditation, you know, sort of the sit quietly and, and cross your legs and close your eyes, um, Blue Mind is an on-ramp. And it, it doesn't mean you can't also meditate, but it is a the water meditates us, does some of the work. And uh, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, we also talk a lot about expanding our awareness on this podcast. It's all about, you know, learning, becoming more aware, opening up the keyhole, um, seeing things from a, a bigger point of view. And then uh, within the book, you talk about how being curious is also an important part of learning. And you say Blue Mind is deep down about human curiosity and knowing ourselves better, which is all about self-awareness, one of the main social emotional learning competencies that are taught in our schools now because we weren't taught how to be self-aware. So I, I just wonder, how can this idea you've discovered, Blue Mind, help us to become more self-aware? What should we actually do to practice this? Well, my my personal experience is that when when I when I I'm in crisis of any kind, when I feel what I call red mind, anxious and urgency and that I need to respond, I, I'm not I'm not at my best. Um, I be I can become defensive. My thinking narrows, my focus narrows, it pigeonholes. Um, you get into the fight or flight response. Uh, you may panic. Um, and that's useful. It's use, It's a useful way to respond to the world around us. There's a reason why we have that response. It saves our butts sometimes. But increasingly, we're that's being triggered all the time. You know, uh, the technology, our interactions, social media, text messaging, um, and and so we're in this constant, at least mild red mind state, which eventually will lead you to burnout. That's gray mind, uh, guaranteed with physical, emotional, social uh, anxiety, stress will burn you out. So it's just, you know, even if you're a superhuman person, um, it will take you out eventually. Um, so blue mind, is a place where you can to rest, relax, breathe, have some perspective, uh, pause, 
um, step back, see the, see the field a little bit better, um, see things for what they are, perhaps, um, take a more curious, creative approach, maybe more compassionate. Uh, if you feel like you're in a conflict, you know, in that mind state, you may appreciate the the opponent, so to speak, better. Um, and that's useful. Uh, so I think that's, you may understand yourself better. I mean, when you're in red mind, you're not really doing a lot of deep self-reflection. Uh, you're not giving yourself much of a break. Um, you're, you're, it's a competitive, anxious place. So I think uh, the water always helps, you know, just think about it in your own life. Like, oh, if I'm, if I'm feeling a little edgy and I just take, take a bath, um, it doesn't solve all your problems, but it, it pauses them and it gives you perspective, which may help you solve your problems or take a walk by the water, go, go spend some time in nature. And, uh, I'm very ecumenical about water, all of its forms. Most plants are up to 90% water. So that counts. <laughs> Go outside, be with the water-based life in nature, be with the lakes and the rivers and the creeks. Um, and let your let your mind move into that that better place for for problem solving and for for thinking. Self-awareness is a big part of it. Um, notice you know, how that works while it's happening. That's always good because then you are likely to do it again if it works well for you. Um, so that's that's kind of how that that fits together. Um, but the red mind and the gray mind and the blue mind, those are, those are useful. To, it's a cartoon terminology, oversimplification, I'll admit, of very complex uh, neurochemistry and psychology. But People have a hard time talking about their emotional uh, well-being. So if we can color code it and I can say, hey, I've been feeling too much red mind. I'm slipping in the gray mind. I need to get some blue mind. You know what I'm talking about, exactly. but I'm not using the scary language that I don't want in my permanent file <laughs> at right. work about depression and anxiety and burnout and any of that. I can, I can approach it in a, maybe a lighter way, but in a useful way. And um, I think that's a good thing. Exactly. And I like how you mentioned baths and showers because um, so here I am in Arizona and I'm landlocked and, you know, vacations are, you know, gone and there's no ocean here for me to go walk by. And so, you know, my writing comes alive at the ocean, but what can I do when, you know, I don't have access to that or, you know, so, you know, it just really helps to see. I never really thought about it. I, I do take baths. I love taking baths and, um, you know, going out and sitting by the pool outside, you know, just figuring out what water have I got here. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what, what have you discovered specifically about, um, you know, different ways to get access to the water. There are so many ways to do Blue Mind, first of all. And I've never met some, I've, I've met people who have said, I don't have access, what do I do? And then by the end of the conversation, they realized they have massive access. They just didn't. Yeah, they were thinking, they were thinking the conversation was about that beautiful turquoise water on the other side of the world that they can't get to easily. And what it really is, is about all of the water, including the water where you are in the desert, in Oklahoma, in Arizona, anywhere, if, if you're in the frozen tundra, um, we'll work with that. So I'll go, I usually walk people through something I call blue scription, which is a very personal um, account of your ability to do blue mind wherever you are. And we start with the wild water. What, what wild water can you get to every day? every week, every month, maybe once a year, or maybe once in your lifetime. So it could be a river that's down the road that you could 
maybe you pass it every day on your way to work. You could notice it a little more, or you can pause on the bridge. Um, maybe there's a little road trip you can do once a month. And then there's a longer, bigger trip that you can plan to do where you spend a week on the beach floating around. So those are your wild waters, lakes, rivers, oceans, rain, ponds, um, ice and snow, fog and clouds. It's all unbridled wild water. But then you go to your domestic water, which is your what's in your bathroom. Uh, if you have access to a pool or a spa or a tub, a uh, hot tub, maybe your neighbor, <laughs> um, maybe you belong to a club. Um, if your bathtub or your bathroom needs a little sprucing up, do it. Put a candle in there, uh, dim the lights, lock the door, tell everybody you're going down for some blue mine time. Um, so that's the domestic water and it's pools, tubs, showers. Then there's the urban water. So your urban waterfronts could be the, a riverfront that's been developed with benches and or a fountain in your town or your city. There are lots of architectural fountains that are wonderful to sit by. So take the time during your lunch break or in the evening and sit by a fountain or walk around it, or walk to it as a destination or an urban waterfront. And then the last two are much more universal. Um, the one is virtual water. We touched on that earlier. So poetry and songs and recordings of water, and, um, apps that play rain or waves or river sounds. Um, make your own recording of the water you love and play that back. Um, the uh, uh, songs about water that you love, movies about water, uh, you know, Avatar, <laughs> Avatar 2 this is all about water. And just you, you feel it. You feel the blue mind in that film. Um, uh, paintings, photography, documentary films, uh, sculptures, uh, so the, that's the virtual water. And the, the last one is imaginary water. So when you close your eyes and think of the water you love and tell that story to yourself or tell it to someone and think of the smell and the taste and the sound and the sight and the feel of the water you love and how it felt to be there with the people you care about. Um, maybe it's a childhood memory. Maybe it's last month. Uh, maybe it's a bunch of different scenarios. But thinking about that reactivates our nervous system, assuming it's a positive experience. And we slip into a little blue mind state. And people who guide meditations often use water imagery uh, in, in that process. So close your eyes, imagine you're standing at the edge of the ocean and you feel the waves lapping your feet. There's a reason, it works really, really, really well. Uh, you don't need somebody to do it for you. You can just do it. So you're you're carrying around this massive um, imagination everywhere you go and all of these memories and activating the blue mind memories whenever, wherever you need them is a good practice. So those are the five forms. And if we were to go through um, for you or for anyone and just make a list of, of all of the ways you can access blue mind in each of those five categories you'd have a huge list yeah. and then you can break it down and see which things you can do daily which you can do weekly monthly maybe once a year and then the far reach you know expedition maybe that you dream about and even dreaming about it will get you yeah. into your blue mind so Good. um i love doing that with people and with a group with some paper in front of us and people walk away just Blown kind away. of astound yeah, astounded by how much um, they have to work with wherever they are. That, that's our experience, uh, our awareness just expanded as you went through those. I never thought yeah. about, I definitely didn't think about my imagination. You know, I thought, oh, the trips are over, it's done. And here I am spending a lot of time on, on meditation and holding images on the screen of your mind. I never thought about doing it with water. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so important while you're at the water, consciously make the memories Like take the time and say, you know what? This is amazing. This moment right now, I want to think about this 
a lot more when I'm not here anymore. So lay down those memories consciously and purposefully with intention and and breathe in the smell and pay attention to it and listen to the birds and the waves so that it's as vivid as it can possibly be. So that when you go back to it while you're sitting in an office and it's hundred and gazillion degrees outside, you can you can sink into it because you took the time in that moment to make it a rich memory. Uh, and you know that becomes our nostalgia in in the best possible sense. You know, as we age, we lean on our nostalgia more and more. Um, you have to you have to make the nostalgia. Uh, you have to make the experiences and the memories that then become your nostalgia. And what better to be nostalgic about than um, beautiful lakes, rivers, oceans, waterways, um, beautiful moments with the people you care about. So uh, that's part of it. Yeah. So, so I know we talked about the emotional side of this because I, I wasn't going to ignore it. When it starts coming up, I'm going to talk about it. But um, I, I definitely put it here in the middle, and I should have thought my emotions were going to come out at the start. So, the bad placement of the question. But um, there was a part in the book where you you were told to keep that fuzzy stuff out of your science, young man. <laughs> emotions not rational. And you're, it, it's not quantifiable and it's not science. And it just blew me away when I read that because it took me back to Dr. Dan Siegel, who's all through your book. And he was told the same thing in medicine. He wanted to put his arm around people he was caring for. And he was told, get your emotion out of medicine. And so he quit, you know. So, you know, what are we missing when we ignore the fuzzy stuff? Like, well, first thing we're missing is that it's the hardest science in the room, uh, unless you're at, at an unless you're attending an astrophysics conference, and then it's like number two in terms of the the rigor, the technical side of it. Um, when we're talking about the science of emotion, it's it's complex, rigorous, um, high tech science. If you if you look into the science, so. Usually, when people think it's fuzzy, they haven't they haven't cracked a neuroscience uh, textbook or journal. So that's the first thing that it's an indication of that they don't really know what they're talking about. And I can say that now, but back when I was a student, I was just sort of stuck. But looking back on it, that's probably one of the things I would have said. Like I would have handed them some journal articles and said, "Get back to me uh, after you read some of this." Um, the other thing is that. Um, you know, Dan, Dan Siegel, who's a friend, and we've taught together, he knows this. And um, other neuroscientists have said that you, you can't make a decision. Um, Dr. Damasio, Antonio Damasio, wrote a book called Descartes' Error back in the early 90s. He said, it's the, book, the summary of the book is that you can't even make a decision without emotion. If it was pure, if it was purely rational, you would be stuck in a data collection analysis loop that was never ending. So if you, if you say, okay, what should I have for breakfast? Well, um, do you care about food miles? Do you care about calories? Do you care about protein? Do you have a spreadsheet of everything you've eaten for the past three years available? Um, do you have a spreadsheet? Do you care about cost? Um, do you care about your, your blood sugar level at the time you wake up? So there's a lot of information that you should have before you decide what to eat for breakfast. Do we do that? No, you would never eat breakfast. You'd be stuck. You'd be paralyzed in analysis. So you make a, a decision based partly on emotion. Like, how do I feel? Um, what do I like? What tastes good? What's available? What's convenient? Those are, those are kind of em emotional components. Um, and then you backfill with the rationalization. And that's generally how the human brain works. And, you know, obviously there are big decisions that you want to have as much information as possible and be as rational as possible. But the decision-making process, like going from deciding to decided and then action, involves emotion. It's an emotional moment where you pull the trigger on a decision and you do it. Um, because you're never going to have complete 
information. You're never going to have complete knowledge about anything. It's just impossible. So you can fool yourself into thinking you have complete or enough knowledge, but ultimately it's an emotional decision. And that was a big, a big aha moment for me reading Antonio Damasio's book, Descartes' Error. I was like, wow. So in, in environmental conservation, we need to make decisions based on the best available data, but there's an emotional component. Our emotional connection with nature should not be discounted. Um, the benefits, the emotional well-being benefits of nature and all of its forms are usually left out of the accounting. So that's a problem. Um, the, o- the story we tell about why should we save the ocean goes something like it, it gives us 70, it covers 71% of the planet, gives us half our oxygen, feeds billions of people, employs billions of people, regulates climate, holds biodiversity, and a bunch of other facts. That is the most boring ocean story I've ever heard, but we keep thinking it's gonna compel people to care and change their behavior and it's gonna move them. Um, Those are all facts. And some of them are a little not so accurate, but they're, they're meant to be factual, convincing arguments. So the ecological and economic, but the emotional component that we're told to leave out is the catalyst. So if I say all those things are true that I just told you, all those percentages and big numbers, but the ocean also gives us peace of mind and heart. It gives us romance. It gives us solitude and privacy. Uh, It gives us creativity. It gives us a sense of freedom and possibility. It provides awe and wonder and hope. Um, All the things Jacques Cousteau and his granddaughter Celine alluded to. And there's a list of a hundred more things I could add to that, right? It boosts compassion and empathy. Um, Goes on and on and on. All of the emotional benefits of a healthy ocean. But we discount that, we exclude it. And as a result, we undervalue the ocean. We undervalue our lakes and rivers. We undervalue ourselves. We undervalue our interactions with each other. And then that bad value, poorly formed value equation always leads to to bad things happening. Whether we undervalue each other or we undervalue nature, that always leads to heartbreak and destruction. Uh, Every time human history has shown, when when we undervalue each other, bad things happen. When we undervalue nature, we wreck the place. Um, So really, Blue Mind is about fixing that value equation, bringing in in the touchy-feely stuff, which is, in fact, the hardest science in the room, and some of the coolest science as well, and bringing that into the story that we're telling uh, our kids and each other and the public uh, about the wild world, about oceans and, and lakes and rivers. And, you know, I, I think it's, I, can, I I have not found any downside to this concept um, yet. And I don't, I don't think there is one, but. So when I was, when I was reading it and got close to the end, I was kind of surprised by all of the organizations that were involved that you mentioned in the beginning, you know, people with PTSD or addiction or autistic children. And then I even was so moved when you took those young kids to Porto Penasco, because, you know, over the 4th of July, I was at at that Sea of Cortez over there. And just imagining that they didn't have swimsuits and how you were cutting their their jeans. You know, I, I worked with some disadvantaged children and took them swimming once and remember what it was like in a swimming pool, but I can't imagine the ocean. So I just wonder what's impacted you the most with the water's healing effects that you've seen in your studies. Well, I there's been an explosion of groups, organizations, projects who are putting Blue Mind into practice. It's so amazing. I mean, the ones I wrote about it 10 years ago, now for every one, there's a hundred more, literally, all over the world. And that is awesome. 
truly awesome. Um, what, what impacts me daily the most is seeing that this, this practice, this idea helps the people who need it the most, helps them the most. So when people are, you know, hanging on at the end, whether it's post-traumatic stress, anxiety, burnout, um, families that are dealing with autism, uh, end of life care, um, all of it, all of, all of the heavy stuff that humans are handling right now. Um, when I, I, I hear from people who need it most and who benefit the most, uh, if you're feeling great, you're like, this is a cool podcast. I'm feeling fine. I'm sure maybe I've never felt better. It'll help you too. It'll move your needle. But what's so compelling to me is the people who are, who just need it the most. I mean, I'll leave it kind of wide open there, but, um, and in, in my, my life when I've needed it the most, um, recently and in a recent past and going through things. I feel that, I feel, you know, it can save your life, literally. It certainly can make your life better, but I hear from people who um, have found, you know, just tremendous healing uh, to get through, get through the day in some cases. Um, some of the veterans that we work with uh, have told stories that are just break your heart open. Um, so that's that's the thing that sort of, that's the fire in my belly is when I I know that uh, I know that there are people sitting on their couch in their basement not sure what the point is um, you know go go get them like give them a call maybe stop by grab their hand and say hey we're gonna go fishing. I got a, I got a second fishing pole or I got a second surfboard or I got a, a tandem kayak or let's just go stomp in some puddles in the rain. Um, let's go play with water. Um, let's go throw water balloons at each other. I don't know, just whatever it is. Let's go, let's go get wet somewhere. Um, you know, you know who they are, you know, you know, their name, you know, their address. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's about as, that brings it like down to the nitty gritty, personal, local, um, and talk about it and share, share what works, you know, um, put your story on social media and say, Hey, this blue mind thing worked for me. It might work for you. You don't need a tropical far flung vacation. Uh, yeah. That was, that was powerful. Just to kind of bring this into a close, um, we've got World Blue Mind Day is coming up this weekend. That kind of blew me away when I said, you know, what would be the final thought? I can see here you've written this beautiful book. Uh, I think everyone's got to read it and figure out how they're going to apply it. And like you said, extend your hand out and introduce Blue Mind to others. But what else can we do with World Blue Mind Day? What, what, what's going on with that? Yeah, um, it's really pretty, op pretty open-ended. You know, use the hashtag Blue Mind if you do social media. Um, most important isn't the digital part. It is the actually going, like if these ideas make sense, go try it out. Like go do something you weren't going to do otherwise. Um, go go find your water, whatever it is, and just pay attention to how it feels and reflect on what we've been talking about here. And um, every every July twenty third, seven twenty three, uh, is World Blue Mind Day, and really it is meant to you know practice blue mind and take someone with you, um, and then share your story. And what in whatever form that is, it might be a conversation at dinner. Uh, you might feel compelled to write a poem or share a photograph or make some artwork um, or just have some conversations about it. Um, and uh, there's no 
you know, there's no big organization behind it. Uh, this the goal is not to build an organization or a brand. The goal is common knowledge. So take it and run with it, and and put your creativity into it. It's 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 your idea. It's your blue mind. Um, and you know, you can do it every day. You don't have to just <laughs> wait around for a world blue mind day. But it just was a fun thing to add to the the mix of activities. So. Oh, well, Dr. Nichols, I've thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you today. I want to thank you so much for sharing your book and this movement, Blue Mind. And I really don't think you left a stone unturned with your research. As I went through, I was just mesmerized. So Blue Mind is a resource I'm going to add now as I reflect on episodes on meditation. I'll talk about Blue Mind and the practices that you've brought to light. So I just want to wish you the best of luck for where your vision of Blue Mind takes you. And thank you so much for giving back today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for taking the time and and um, and your, your care with your questions and your thoughts and your reflections. Are, uh, I really appreciate that. It was a very important interview today. Thank you so much. Some final thoughts and reflections. If you watch the YouTube version of this interview, you'll see a body of water and a shipwreck in the photo. That was taken on our family trip to Turks and Caicos this past June, and it's of the famous La Famille Express shipwreck that you can visit and actually walk through. You can even jump off the back of the ship into the ocean. And in the photo that's throughout the video, I'm covered, but I'm actually standing on the back of the ship too afraid to jump. I thought it was fitting to put this image throughout this interview, especially as we spoke about how to use the ocean to increase our levels of awareness, our happiness, and our creativity. I wonder, what was I afraid of? I've always had this fear of jumping into water, and who knows where it came from. Maybe from my old lifeguarding days when they taught us to be careful for jumping into water where we don't know what's underneath it. But what's interesting is that you can see a photo of the crystal clear ocean on the website showing me that there would be no rocks or anything that could harm me while jumping into the ocean. Would this new knowledge make me less afraid? I think it would. When we can see where we're going, the path becomes clearer. But when we're stressed out, what Dr. Nichols called red mind, we can't think clearly. I remember standing on the back of the ship and I'd thrown my flip-flops into the water so there was no way I could walk down through the rusted ship, but I still couldn't jump in. My red mind had taken over and there was no ability for me to think or reason. So for me, my biggest aha moment and takeaway from Dr. Nichols' interview is that as we all increase our levels of awareness with whatever it is in our life that's unknown that could be causing us stress, anxiety, and worry, like Dr. Nichols said, if something has got you feeling anxious, just try to find your way to water and pay attention to how you're feeling. Reflect on what we discussed on this episode and see if you can begin to feel some level of peace as you practice accessing Blue Mind into your daily life. Can you now take this new level of awareness and move forward in some way? And if you know someone who might be struggling with something, grab their hand and take them fishing. Sunday, July 23rd is World Blue Mind Day. The most important part of this is to go out and practice Blue Mind, Dr. Nichols said, and then see where it takes you. Does it take you to increased happiness, creativity, problem solving and thinking, leading us to freedom, possibility, wonder and hope? If so, then I'm in. And what about you? I'd love to hear your Blue Mind story and what you think of Dr. Nichols' book when you read it. And I'll see you next week.